Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Artemy Kolchinsky. Uh, Artemy uh, got his uh, PhD at Indiana University in Complex Systems and is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, his works uh, spans uh, stochastic thermodynamics, machine learning, uh, uh, information theory. And today, uh, I guess, is going to talk about uh, um, thermodynamics of information. Uh, just uh, a few rules uh, before starting. Uh, so there are, uh, you, if you have any question, you can just unmute yourself uh, and, uh, ask, uh, uh, and ask your question during the talk. So with that, I leave the floor to Artem. Thank you, Jacopo. You can hear me? Yes, everyone. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, like Jacoba said, I'm going to be talking about um, thermodynamics information and also more generally entropy production under what we call protocol constraints, which I'll describe below. And I just want to say that this is a joint work with uh, David Walpert, who is a uh, faculty at Santa Fe Institute and who is also connected now. And uh, this is um, in progress, so the preprint should be available soon, but if you are interested in seeing it, please also feel free to email me. Uh, okay, so oh. my talk uh, will consist generally of three sections. So the first section, I'll provide a pretty general background of um, <clears throat> thermodynamics and particularly the concept of free energy, and also recent work on the so-called thermodynamic value of information. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to try to motivate the basic problem behind our approach and convince you that maybe it's an interesting problem. And uh, in the final section, I'll give some of the results we've derived so far, in particular ones that concern what we call symmetry and modularity constraints. So let me begin with the background introduction. And uh, I'm going to talk about what is thermodynamics, in particular, what is the role of free energy in thermodynamics? So I take thermodynamics uh, at a very high level to be the science of understanding what transformations are allowed or not allowed by the fundamental laws of physics. And let me explain this with uh, the following setup, which I'll use to illustrate the basic laws of thermodynamics. So imagine that we have a physical system uh, whose state, we thermodynamic state, we describe uh, with two functions. The first one is P, which is the probability distribution over the microstates of the system. And E is the energy function uh, that the system is subjected to. So this might be something like uh, a, you know, a box of gas with a piston on one side. It could be a little biological organism. It could be many things. And we're going to assume that this physical system is coupled to two so-called thermodynamic reservoirs, or I guess one thermodynamic reservoir and a work reservoir. The thermodynamic reservoir is what's called a heat bath, uh, and it's going to have a certain temperature T. And it's, uh, the physical system is also going to be coupled to a work reservoir, um, which could be something like a weight connected to a pulley. Now, over some time interval from uh, time zero to times tau, the physical system will undergo a driving protocol. And I will define later precisely what I mean by a driving protocol. Uh, but for, for now, you can just think of it that basically during the driving protocol, the distribution of the system changes over time. And the energy function of the system can also change over time. And so at time tau, it's going to end up in some different probability distribution, p prime, and some di different energy function, e prime. And in doing so, it can also exchange some energy with the heat bath and the work reservoir. OK. So the, I can now tell you what the laws of thermodynamics state about this. And we'll see that they provide constraints on what kinds of transformations are possible, uh, are allowed by the fundamental laws of physics. I should. and. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics states that energy is conserved. And in this case, we can basically say that the change of energy of all of these three coupled systems has to be zero. And we also know that we typically call 
the energy exchange uh, or the energy given to the heat baths as heat. Me neither. Oh, I think he got disconnected. Um, uh, I think, uh, yes. He's coming back. He's connected. Let's see if he. Uh, he's moving now, but he's muted. I'm see. sorry. I think my connection dropped. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm back. So apologies. Um, so we're going to write the heat, the energy given to the reservoir as heat, and uh, the energy given to the work reservoir as work, W. So we write them as Q and W. And the first law of thermodynamics says that unless this is obeyed, this equation is obeyed, then the transformation is not allowed. Sorry, you're, and, you're not sharing. Oh. Or at least I don't see it. Thank you for telling me. Am I sharing now? Yes. Yes. So uh, hopefully that won't happen again. Um, so I talked about the first law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics says that the overall entropy of uh, this whole setup has to increase. Now, the work reservoir is actually defined in such a way that it has no, uh, cannot change its entropy. So we can write the second law is basically saying that the entropy of the system and the entropy of the heat bath together have to increase. And uh, the overall increase of the entropy of everything we're considering at once is, I'm gonna write a sigma, and in thermodynamics, this is usually called entropy production or irreversible entropy production sometimes. And we also uh, can rewrite this thing on the right-hand side as just the increase of the Shannon entropy of the system. So the uh, entropy of P prime minus entropy of B plus the, uh, the entropy increase of the bath is actually given by Q, the amount of heat divided by KT, where K is Boltzmann's constant. And this is just, comes from the fundamental definition of what a heat bath is and what the temperature is. So I also want to emphasize that uh, this will be the general uh, setup that I'll be thinking about you during this talk, but the framework extends more broadly. It can also encompass things like multiple heat baths at different temperatures and other kinds of thermodynamic reservoirs like chemical baths and other things. And we can still define uh, things like the first law and the second law, but I, I won't, for simplicity, I will consider the simple case of a single heat bath and a single work rest for a couple to our system. So if we now take this first law and the second law and uh, combine them and rearrange them, we can actually define a fundamental bound on how much work we can extract by carrying out any such transformation. And um, the, the maximal amount of work that we can extract from the system is given by the drop of the so-called non-equilibrium free energy of the system. And the non-equilibrium free energy is just given as the expected energy plus KT um, S. Sorry, that, I think that should be minus. Should be minus KT. Now, um, I want to point out that this is well defined even for distributions that are out of equilibrium. And um, so this, this is a really non-equilibrium bound. Um, and it can practice, so in theory, this bound can be achieved by certain types of protocols. They can saturate this work bound, but this can require various uh, somewhat unrealistic resources. And as we'll see that in practice, it may be actually quite difficult to achieve this bound. 
And this will be something that we'll return to throughout this talk. I also want to point out that um, the entropy production is just given by the excess of this inequality. And uh, so basically the, the, the work inequality is equivalent to saying that entropy production is not negative, which is the second law. Okay, so I'm now gonna provide a simple example of this and I'll use a system that we'll uh, return to throughout this talk. So this is a, a Gillard box with a vertical partition. And by this, I mean the following. So this is a box that's connected to a heat bath and uh, there's a particle inside the box that can bounce around the box. And there's also a vertical partition or barrier that we can move left and right. And by moving it in different ways, we can basically manipulate the location of the particle. So imagine that the initial distribution P is one in which the particle is in the right half of the box with probability one. How do we, can we extract some work from this and how much work can we extract and how do we do it? Well, let's say that we go from this initial distribution uh, and we end up at a final distribution P prime where the particle is uniformly distributed throughout the box. And for simplicity, I'm gonna assume that the initial and final energy function is just uniform across the whole box, which basically means that we can dis disregard the energetic contributions and just focus on the entropic contributions. So if we consider this system and we evaluate the fundamental work and extractive, or the fundamental bound and extractable work, we see that it's the maximum amount of work that we can extract is given by KT times the increase of the entropy of the system. And in this case, the entropy goes up by one bit. So in units of uh, Nats, which is the more common unit in uh, statistical physics, uh, that's just, that can be written as KT times log two. And in fact, we can achieve this bound arbitrarily closely by very quickly moving the partition to the middle of the box at the beginning of the protocol, and then slowly very slowly expanding it leftwards, all the while extracting uh, work uh, from the particle as, as, the, as it's the volume it occupies expands. And I write this by saying that the, yeah, the, the, the actual work can be very close to this bound of KT log two. Okay, so I've talked about uh, the second and uh, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, and I've talked about uh, the bound on work that, that comes from it and the non-equilibrium free energy. And the next thing I want to talk about is the thermodynamics of information, which is a kind of recent hot area of study in non-equilibrium statistical physics. So what do I mean by the thermodynamic value of information? Well, uh, it's, I'm going to explain it using the following setup. So this is a very similar setup as before. Where we, we imagine that we have a physical system that's coupled to a heat bath and a work reservoir. And, but now, before the system undergoes driving, we can make a measurement of the system using some observation apparatus. And I'm going to write this as a measurement M of the system X. And now, the system, once we've made a measurement of the system and we know something about its state, uh, the system can un again undergo a driving protocol, but the driving protocol can now depend on the particular outcome of the measurement. And uh, if this seems abstract to you, I'll explain with an example in the next slide. So I think it'll make more sense. And uh, we again have the extracted work, and but now we can actually average the extracted work, which I indicate here with on the left-hand side with this bracket notation across different outcomes of the measurement. And we can say on average, how much work do we extract? And it turns out that by acquiring information about the system and then using this, that information to drive the system in different ways, we can increase the amount of work we can extract from the system and we can increase it by KT times the mutual information that was acquired in the measurement. And um, so, and again, in principle, like the, the previous bound, the work bound I talked about, In principle, it, it is possible to design protocols that come arbitrarily close to this bound, 
but in practice, this will often be difficult and it won't be achievable. And again, I'll, I'll return to when cases where it won't be achievable. Let me give you an example uh, of this set. Mm -hmm. Artemi, sorry for interrupting, but you said it's okay. Um, can I ask uh, again, what is uh, the mutual information between what and what? What is M again? Uh, yes, of course. Good, good question. So oh. the, uh, the, so, so X is the state of the system. So X is the state space of the system. Basically, it's what the distribution P is over. M is a random variable, which is the outcome of some arbitrary measurement. Okay, so um, let, me give, let me give a very concrete example in the next slide, and please interrupt me again if it's still not clear. Okay, okay. thank you. So uh, let me contrast the two bounds we showed before. So we had the Giller box without measurement, and for simplicity, we imagine that the box begins with the particle uniformly distributed throughout it. And over the course of some protocol, it ends again in a different distribution, and it's actually in the same distribution, but we call it P prime, where the particles again uniformly distributed throughout the box. And uh, we can say, what is the maximal work we can extract from the system? Again, assuming the same uniform energy function at the beginning and end, obviously the system starts and ends in, in the same thermodynamic state. So uh, it's a cyclic process, basically, and we can't extract any work from it. Now, let's imagine that we perform a measurement of the box. So again, the, the box starts with the particle uniformly distributed throughout it, but now we perform a measurement and we use some kind of apparatus to say, uh, is the particle on the left side of the box or is the particle on the right side of the box? And essentially, this, uh, there's two possible outcomes. So we kind of split our uh, you know, trajectory into two different, uh, there's a fork in the road, so to speak. And uh, let's say half the time uh, it will be on the right side of the box and half the time it will be on the left side of the box. So M here would be just like right or left, just like that one bit of measurement, if that makes sense. Now, given whether it was on the right or the left, we can apply different protocols to the particle. So if it was on the, on the right, we can move the barrier to the middle of the box and then slowly expand it leftward. If it was on the left, we can move the barrier to the middle of the box and then slowly expand it outward. And in both of these cases, uh, we can essentially extract kT log 2 of work. And so the expected energy we can extract given this measurement is given by kT log 2. And of course, this is also exactly the amount of information that we acquired in the, in the measurement. So it's the equal, log 2 is equal to the mutual information between X and M. So this shows how this bound uh, can actually be achieved. Now, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with classic sort of paradoxes like Maxwell's demon, you can recognize this. This is basically one part of, of uh, the operation of a Maxwellian demon. And this whole framework of thermodynamics of information was originally used to basically demystify and, and rigorously analyze how um, uh, the, the thermodynamics of a Maxwell's demon. Okay, so this is all great, um, but before proceeding to the next section, I just want to throw out the, the following kind of problematic example. So imagine, again, this Gillard box that we're stuck with, uh, but now there's a twist, right? So now, instead of the particle starting on the left side of the box, we say the particle is in the top half of the box. And uh, we carry out some driving protocol or maybe just a free relaxation or something. And at the end of which the particle is uniformly distributed throughout the box. And we ask how much work can we extract during the course of this transformation? So we can actually see that the entropy increase in this case and so also the free energy drop uh, well the entropy is increased is one bit, so the free energy drop is kT log 2. So the second law states that the maximum amount of work we can extract is given by kT log 2. But in this case, this seems very optimistic and unrealistic. Intuitively, at least, it seems like there's no way to move this vertical position, no matter how we move it, we won't be able to extract work from 
this distribution where the particle is on top half of the box, right? There's a kind of misalignment between how we can manipulate the system and what we know about the statistical state of the system. And so uh, the intuition is we won't be able to extract work and this, this drop in free energy would actually have to be dissipated as entropy production. So the question is, uh, is it possible to prove that no work can be extracted in this case? And this is the basic motivation of problem formulation. So can we derive some bounds that are tighter than the bounds provided by the second law when hold when there's constraints on how we can manipulate the system under study? And by constraints, I mean, for example, that we don't have, we only have a vertical part partition that we can move around. We don't have a horizontal partition that we can also bring in and move around or, or some other shape partition, right? We have a very limited, sort of set of uh, tools or, or, or um, yeah, tools that we can apply to the system. And uh, of course, this is more general than just the Gillard box. You know, we would like to kind of study this in the general case or as general as possible. Uh, what are the bounds on how much work can be extracted from a system when we're limited and how we can manipulate it? And I actually think that this, this question is quite fundamental in statistical physics, although it hasn't uh, attracted a great deal of attention up to now. And I think there's a quote from Maxwell, which is kind of interesting from, uh, and, and relevant to this question. So the quote, uh, which is from the 1878, goes as follows. So, so Maxwell was really thinking about this notion of free energy, which he called available energy, and uh, entropy production or dissipation, and which he called dissipated energy. And he said the following. So available energy is energy which we can direct into any desired channel. Dissipated energy is energy we cannot lay hold of and direct at pleasure, such as the energy of the confused agitation of molecules, which we call heat. Now confusion, like the correlative term order, is not a property of material things in themselves, but only in relation to the mind which perceives them. And uh, I think it's very interesting because Maxwell is very aware that uh, the fundamental concepts of statistical physics, things like free energy, um, uh, order and confusion and so on, are not absolute properties, but are relative to the agent that's interacting with the system. And in particular, there's two different, or at least in my reading, there's two different things, at least that he draws attention to. First is in relation to the mind which perceives them, which I would say is, can be thought of as the information that we possess about the state of the system. And uh, this kind of perspective on free energy, which was also uh, argued for by, by James, very famously the inventor of maximum entropy, I would say has now become very standard in non-equilibrium statistical physics. So for example, I talked about uh, this, the definition of non-equilibrium free energy, which have a minus sign throughout, by the way, sorry about that. But uh, you see that it depends on P, which is the statistical state of the system. And this P is really can capture our knowledge uh, or uncertainty about the state of the system. So we saw, for example, that when we make a measurement of the system, for example, is the particle on the left or the right-hand side of the box, we actually update uh, effectively this distribution P. So we change the statistical state of the system. And the second law, the work bound, then also depends on this P. So it depends on what we know. But there's also a second part of this quote, which is this, this ability to direct the energy into any desired channel. So to, the ability to lay hold of and direct at pleasure, which, I think is a, is a kind of somewhat different aspect, which is our ability to manipulate the system. And I think our ability to manipulate the system, uh, although it's kind of often intertwined with what we know about the system, it can be different. So for example, in the previous, uh, uh, in the previous example, we might know that the particle in the Schiller box is the top half of the box, but we might not be able to manipulate the system in such a way so as to extract work from that. And one of the things we'd like to do in this project is to derive some kind of bound on the extractable work, which is maybe written in terms of some kind of effective free energy. Uh, so, which, and this effective free energy, 
which it's not entirely clear how we will define it just yet, uh, should reflect our ability to manipulate the system given some constraints um, on, on the protocols available to us. So one might ask, um, yes. So I wonder if that uh, effectiveness also has to do with the dynamics of the system itself, because information also have relevance in terms of time. When I know that the particle is in one half of the box, this won't stay like that forever. If I don't quickly put the, the, um, the piston in the right place, the, the particle will move to the other side and we lose the relevance of this information. Do you also take that into account when you say uh, effectiveness? Um, so that's a really good point and um, I will go back to that. So we consider, so there are many things that could be the, considered as protocol constraints. Uh, we do think of protocol constraints as the general dynamics that the system can undergo. Uh, in this project, we do not consider things like how fast can you move the piston. Uh, and this, this kind of constraint of like how fast basically can you um, change the energy function or, or, or manipulate the system, that has been considered. It's sometimes considered under what's called finite time thermodynamics. And um, I will go back to that later. So, so I would say we consider sort of half of that, but not entirely. But that's a, that's a very good point. Thank you. I have a related question about this. So, uh, yes. what you call protocol constraints is not a constraint uh, on the protocol itself, but according to your example, it seems a, a constraint on the phase space of the system at the beginning of the protocol. Am I right or I, did, or I misunderstood? <laughs> Um, so I will define what I mean by protocol constraints formally in a couple of slides, but um, I will point out that so here we're sort of assuming that we start with some distribution P and some energy function E and we end with some distribution P prime and some energy function uh, E prime. And so we say, given that we go between those two endpoints and we assume it is possible to go through between those two endpoints, what is the, what is the maximum amount of extractable work? So the constraint is on the initial and the final distribution? No, so that's a give. So I will, let's hold off because yeah, I will sure. define what, by what I mean by constraints. But yeah. that, those are just given parameters, basically. You can make it. Just, uh, uh, if I may, another uh, um, quick question. So, uh, so shouldn't this uh, effective free energy depends on something else, like uh, what you are measuring uh, or uh, what you can control or does it only depends on P and uh, E? It will depend on what, what I mean by, by the constraints available to us. It will not, I mean, so given, given a certain set of, let's say, I mean, there's many ways to define it, but we will define it in a particular way. Well, it will just depend on P and E, but also generally on the set of protocols available to us. Okay, thanks. Art Artemy, it might be worth pointing out here that P, like in Jane's, is the probability distribution in the mind of the user, what they know about the system. So even if their measurement was a year ago, then what goes into the P here is their current uncertainty about the state of the system given their measurement a year ago. It really is all self-contained. All these kinds of issues are just special cases. Thanks. Um, yep, thanks, David. Um, so I just, I, I also want to say, like, you know, why, why do we care? I want to just motivate this approach a bit. Why do we care about deriving this bound, which is going to be stronger than the second law, and it's going to reflect some, some constraints? So I actually think uh, having such bounds is really important for understanding the thermodynamics of all kinds of artificial and especially biological energy harvesting systems or engines, uh, you know, and processes generally. And uh, just to give you an example, you know, for, for if, if I want to understand the thermodynamic value of a food source for a given organism, 
Well, in general, that's not going to depend really on the total non-equilibrium free energy of that food source. It's going to depend also on the driving protocols available that the organism can use to extract energy from that food source, right? So one example I sometimes use is, you know, I can drink a glass of gasoline, which has a very high non-equilibrium free energy, but I can't extract any calories from that. Uh, because I don't have the available protocols, basically. And so if we want to sort of extend these bounds to more realistic scenarios, or at least somewhat more realistic scenarios, we have to consider the fact that, uh, th that you know, these transformations are done by quite limited and restricted agents that are restricted in both what they can know about, about the, st the microstate of the system and how they can manipulate it. Okay. And... Um, I also want to point out that having such a bound, and in general, this perspective of, how, of thinking about how much work we can extract under constraints, also has a lot of implications for the thermodynamics of information under constraints, by which I mean the, the thermodynamic value of different measurements. And I'm going to illustrate this with uh, this example that I'm beating to death. So let's imagine we have the Schiller box and initially it, the particles uniformly distributed throughout the box. And we now measure instead of whether the particle is on the left or right, we measure whether the particle is on the top or the bottom of the box. And we then bring the system to a uniform equilibrium, let's say. Well, again, the second law with information says that the maximum amount of work we can extract from, uh, from this measurement, as we saw previously, is kt log 2. But intuitively, it seems like we should not be able to extract any work on average from the system. And so, in, in, in other words, this measurement, thermodynamically speaking, intuitively seems to be completely kind of worthless uh, or, or irrelevant. And, you know, again, we have the question, can we prove that we can't actually use this measurement to increase the amount of work we can extract? And more generally, can we take some kind of uh, measurement of the state of the system as represented by X and M and decompose it into, let's say, one contribution, which is actually relevant to increasing the amount of work that we can then extract from the system and one contribution, which is irrelevant. And so I basically outlined the motivation of the, of the project, the, now the background and the motivation. I'm just going to summarize it briefly. So the first thing we like to do is derive something like an effective free energy that determines uh, how much work can be extracted from a system under constraints. And we'll also um, see this is closely related to how much entropy production uh, is incurred under constraints. And this will have the form of, of some of, an, of a bound like, like the following. And, um, and as I argued, I think this is quite relevant for sort of making, making thermodynamics more practically applicable to, to various systems we might be interested in studying. And we also, in the second part, want to derive bounds on the thermodynamic value of different kinds of measurements under constraints including uh, some kind of decomposition of the information into work relevant and, and work irrelevant components. And um, I will say that uh, one of the reasons we're interested in the second part is uh, me and David Walpert have this kind of long running project where uh, we've been trying to use statistical physics to, so to speak, put meaning back into information theory. And there's a paper where we talk about this uh, from a few years ago, which you might be interested in. But basically, what we're thinking about is that the second law, of the, uh, the second law with information, just depends on the total number of bits acquired about the state of the system in the measurement. So it just depends on the mutual information between X and M. But we believe that under constraints the thermodynamic value of information will actually depend on what kind of measurement is performed and it will be different for different kinds of measurements. And in general, the measurements that uh, will be sort of qualitatively speaking, the measurements that will be useful from a work perspective will be ones that reflect some kind of alignment, one might say, between the distinctions that the measurement is making versus the kinds of uh, protocols that, the kinds of ways we can drive the system. Okay. So uh, this has been a pretty long introduction.
uh, and motivation. So let me get to some of the results and some uh, that, that we've derived. Um, I've already talked quite a bit about the, the, the physical setup. So this is basically what we're thinking of. All our results also apply to a more general case in which there's multiple heat baths at different temperatures. There's multiple other kinds of possibly thermodynamic reservoirs. But for simplicity, I'm going to restrict attention to this case. And uh, I'm going to define what we mean by driving protocol more formally. So a driving protocol here is uh, going to be a time inhomogeneous trajectory of dynamical generators over this time interval 0 to tau. And I'm going to write the dynamical generator as L of t at time t. And so basically, at any point in time, the distribution of the system is going to evolve according to this. Uh, uh, we can think of it as like a generalized master equation. And for we can think of L of t as being something like a, a, a rate matrix for a discrete state system. It could be something like a Fokker Planck operator for a continuous state system. Uh, in principle, it could also be some other more general kinds of continuous master equations also. Um, and we just assume that the initial value or the initial condition of this uh, differential equation is given by P, so the initial distribution. And at the end of the protocol time tau, we end up at our final state P prime. And <clears throat> given uh, this setup, then we can use existing results from stochastic thermodynamics uh, to compute basically the work and entropy production incurred by the protocol uh, for any initial condition. And I'll, I'll just leave out the details of this, but you can see the citations if you're interested. Okay, so now we're gonna assume that, this, that the set of available driving protocols is constrained. And what do we mean by this? So here's what I define it. So we, say, we assume that the driving protocol is constrained, meaning that at all times t, this, the dynamical generator, L of t, has to fall into some restricted set. Um, and to give you an example, so if, uh, for example, we're considering a Gillard box with a vertical barrier, and we might represent this with a Fokker, with a Fokker it's dynamics with a Fokker-Planck operator. So this would be what's sometimes called a, a Brownian Gillard box. Um, and uh, here, the different elements of lambdas, which is the set of available dynamical generators, would basically be different Fokker-Planck operators with the partition located in different parts of the box. And if we say, OK, this is the set of constraints, Basically, we're saying, okay, all we can do is move the partition around, not, not apply arbitrary different other potentials to the system. So uh, regarding a previous question, note that in some ways we are constraining the dynamics because uh, these dynamical generators can have time scales and so on. Uh, on the other hand, we're not going to be considering uh, constraints on things like, is the driving protocol continuous in time? Is it a continuous function in time? Or how fast can L of t change in time? Uh, those are more questions that are usually considered finite time thermodynamics. And they're also very interesting, but that's not, not what we're, we're going to be thinking about. Um, so uh, especially when we're thinking, for example, in Fokker-Planck operators, really this, this can be thought of as, as restricting the kinds of potentials that we can apply to the system. OK, and so I will now present a theoretical result that we've derived, uh, which is going to be a little bit abstract. But I'll then show how it can be used to derive uh, bounds on entropy production work in some concrete cases. OK. So the theoretical result goes as follows. So assume we have this set of allowed uh, generators lambda, right? And now we're going to propose that there's uh, this operator over the set of distributions, which I'll call phi. And I'm going to call it a projection operator uh, for, for reasons that I'll explain next. Um, and so this operator maps distribution, state distribution, state distributions. And we're going to propose that it obeys two conditions. OK? And then we'll show if it obeys these two conditions, then we have a very nice and interpretable bound on entropy production. That's stated in terms of, of this operator. So uh, the first condition, I'll actually explain with a picture. So 
we can imagine that this operator phi maps every distribution to uh, phi, like p to phi p, right? And we can think of it as mapping p to a point in the image of that operator which I'm, I'm drawing this the image of this operator is this manifold here in blue. Now, the first condition we're gonna require is that if there's some other point in the image of that operator, which I write as phi q, then uh, there's this relation that holds. That basically says that the distance from p to that other point in the image is given by the distance from p to phi p plus the distance from phi p to that point in the image. And here, d, is always uh, the Kolbeck library divergence. And this relationship in information geometry is all, often called the Pythagorean relation because you can kind of think of the Kolbeck library divergence as Euclidean distance squared. And then this is basically saying that uh, the mapping from P to phi P is a kind of projection to the image of the operator and that projection meets the, the, the image at a right angle. And so basically, as I, and I indicate this with the right angle symbol. And this is also why I call phi a projection operator. Um, and so that's one condition. And uh, the second condition basically says that this operator commutes with the time evolution under all the dynamical generators available to us. So uh, it's, and it's a, it's a commutativity relationship that we can also draw in this diagram. It basically says that we can start from P and we can either evolve that distribution under any uh, of the available generators L for some time T and then project it down under phi, or we can first project down under phi and then evolve the projection under L and we end up at the exact same spot. Again, I will, I will demonstrate this with more concrete examples next. So it's, it's, at this point, it's a bit abstract, but, but, um, but it will become more specific as we apply it to different things. So then we have the following result. So we, then we can say that for any protocol that transforms some initial distribution P to some final distribution P prime, the entropy production is lower bounded by basically this drop in the distance between P and its projection from the beginning of the protocol to the end of the protocol. And we also have this result that this drop is non-negative. So we can draw this using the picture on the left-hand side where um, we have basically uh, P evolves to P prime under the, the driving protocol, which I write, draws the gray line. We can imagine the projection of both of those distributions. The green arrows are the distances to the projections. And what we, we prove is that, first of all, this, this distance has to decrease. And this decrease in this distance has to be dissipated as entropy production. It cannot be turned into work. By the way, Jacopo, if you could tell me when I have like five minutes left. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, I think you have 10 minutes. How much time do you have left? 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes now. OK. Is that with questions or without questions? Uh, I mean, you had questions during the talk, so I think uh, I can give okay. you ten minutes without. I see. Okay. So um, I might have to go a little bit faster. But so we then have this bound on the work uh, also, which can be derived simply from that, which basically says that the, the work that can be extracted from transforming P to P prime when the energy function changes from E to E prime is given by, uh, it's basically, the only the, the the work is only extractable from the projection of p under phi, not from p itself. And in fact, we can take the full non-equilibrium free energy, which is the left-hand side of this equation you see, and we can decompose it into a sum of two non-negative terms, where the first term is the effective free energy, which is the the non-equilibrium free energy of that projection projected distribution, plus the uh, what we might call the inaccessible free energy, which given these two inequalities you see above has to be dissipated. So the first part can potentially be turned into work and the second part can never be turned into work. Great, okay, so uh, there's two applications of this theoretical framework that I'll talk about. So the first one is what we call symmetry constraints and the second one is what we call modularity constraints. And each one of these will involve a different definition of phi, which, will, which we can then 
show satisfies the conditions that we require of it, and hence gives us these nice bounds on entropy production and work. And we have some other applications also, but I probably won't have time to talk about them. Um, okay, and so the first thing I wanna say, talk about is what we call symmetry constraints. And by this, we, we mean the following, that basically all of the dynamical generators available to us obey a certain symmetry group. So they commute with the action of a certain group. There's a group that acts on the state space and all the dynamical generators commute with its action. Then we can define phi in this way. So for any distribution P, phi P is basically that distribution symmetrized. It's averaged over the, uh, the elements of that group acting on the state space and we just mix all those together. And in this equation, mu is the, is the hard measure. If you're not familiar with that, that's basically like a uniform distribution over the elements of the group. And we can then show that this phi obeys the requirements we need and we have uh, these nice bounds uh, on entropy production work. Let me demonstrate this with our favorite example, the Gillard box. So we have the Gillard box and uh, it's, it's, it's just from visual inspection, it's easy to see that these uh, potentials that we apply to it by moving the vertical position left and right obey this reflection symmetry. So basically the fokker planck operators obey a vertical reflection symmetry where we can uh, flip everything upside down and, and it's, they're left invariant. That means that, and this, this, this holds for no matter how the partition is, is moved around, right? Uh, no matter what its horizontal position is. That means that we can actually, uh, in this case, the symmetry group is the, uh, the two element symmetric group generated by this vertical flip. And the, uh, this, this phi P basically mixes together the, each distribution with the, that distribution plus the vertically flipped distribution. We can now take this, this, this projection operator phi P uh, and we can use it to derive bounds on how much work we can extract from the Schiller box. So imagine that we want to go from this initial distribution where the particles on the right side of the box to the uniform distribution. We can project both of those under phi. So the one, the distribution where the particles on the right half of the box is already invariant under vertical reflection. So it actually stays the same. The same holds for the uniform distribution, it's invariant. And so if we now apply this work bound, we actually end up with the same exact bound as the second law provided, which says that we can in principle extract up to KT log two of work from this setup. Now, we can imagine an alternative scenario where the particle is in the top half of the box and we map it under phi. Well, in this case, uh, it's easy to show that the uh, under phi, the distribution where the particle is in the top half of the box is actually mapped to a uniform distribution. And if we again evaluate uh, this bound on the work, we see that uh, actually the, the drop in the effective free energy is zero. So no work can be extracted from here. So this, this basically is showing rigorously the intuition that um, we talked about at the beginning of the talk, that there's no way in which uh, using a vertical partition, we can extract work from a setup in which the particles in the top half of the box. We can also use this to think about uh, the thermodynamic value of information so we can say which one bit measurement is more valuable. Is it measuring whether the particle is on the left or the right or whether it's on the top or the bottom? And uh, in this case, you know, we can uh, again evaluate the effective work value. The effective work value of the left hand measurement is bounded by KT log two. The effective work value of the, of the right hand measurement is uh, zero. So it's a completely useless, useless measurement. And again, we can show this rigorously uh, that there's no way to ever extract work from that. Um, okay, so uh, I just want to put up some takeaway messages that, uh, first of all, this, uh, this inaccessible free energy, which is the Koba Kleiber divergence between P and its projection, it's actually a measure of the asymmetry in the distribution P relative to the symmetry group G. 
And it vanishes precisely when the distribution P is, is invariant under the action of G. And so uh, what the, these results say is basically that First of all, the asymmetry can only decrease in going from P to P prime under any, any protocol that obeys this constraint. And this decrease has to be dissipated as, as entropy production. It cannot be turned into work. So the one line summary might be that uh, symmetric driving protocols cannot turn asymmetry into work. Sorry, okay. Okay. so um, now imagine that you take uh, the Zillar box with n particles and you mm -hmm. insert uh, the, the barrier vertically. Then, uh, then it is known that in that case you cannot uh, extract uh, any, imagine that you measure the number of particles uh, on the uh, right side of the box. Then uh, in this case, uh, the uh, what is the symmetry that uh, you would consider is the is also the permutation between the particles in each of the no the so so here so we can think of maybe I should have put this up but if we think of the Fokker Planck operator for like a Brownian Schiller box with the partition located somewhere basically there's a there's going to be like an isotropic diffusion term which comes from the effect of the heat bath and there's going to be a potential term, which comes from the walls of the box and the, and the partition. Yes. Right? And basically, in this case, it actually reduces to a pretty simple, simple analysis that all it really has to do with just the symmetries of that potential. So no matter how many particles are in the box, uh, as long as that potential is vertically symmetric, we have this result. And in no, fact, no, no, it does. Uh, your example, uh, I mean, um, I agree. I mean, but uh, so I'm not referring to your example whether you measure left or right or top or bottom. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm mentioning the case where you measure the number of particles uh, on the right side of the box. And uh, in yes. which case, uh, uh, you cannot extract. Uh, uh, an amount of information which is equal to the mutual information between your measurement uh, and the particle positions. Oh, I see. Um, if you measure the, just so in a basic example, if you measure the number of particles, uh, yes, I don't, I don't think, uh, I would have to think about it more carefully, but you, 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 Right, that might also be a constrained situation where you can't, so you can't, you know, you can't always extract the mutual information, right? Uh, so that might be a case where you can't. That, you no, that you can. I mean, just with, uh, by expansion of the box, uh, you cannot. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. so, and I, I, I think maybe in, in this case, you would need to consider in the symmetry group, uh, uh, permutation between particles. I mean, in a oh. sense, so yeah. one thing one has to be careful about is can you actually take the partition up and slide it down precisely on that border where you say that you know the number of particles to the right or the left? One question is where all you can do is move the piston wall in and out. But another one is where you can actually move, uh, take it out instantaneously, move it over, drop it down in some particular fashion. So well, exactly I think this is... I think this well, we, is the ideal limit where you consider point-wise particles. I mean, if the particles have a size, uh, as a finite size, then you cannot do that. I mean, oh, yeah, of course not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so if the particles have a finite size, that might, like, you can't, that might involve, like, an infinite amount of work. But yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't assume any constraints on how fast you can move the partitions or any continuity. So you can move it arbitrarily into the middle of the box. There is going to be, right, for multiple particles, the symmetry group is going to be more complicated. Uh, but I, th I believe there will still be a symmetry group. It might also involve uh, permuting. That's an interesting case. So it might involve both like flipping uh, maybe the vertical, the vertical position of all the particles and permuting them. And uh, again, there will be, so this, there will be this kind of symmetrizing operator that uh, gives us a tighter bound on the amount of work extractable. Now, but, but that, I also should say our tighter bound 
it's not always achievable. In some cases it is, in some cases it's not. So it is going to be tighter in general, but um, you know, it's, I, that's why I kind of say like, it's the effect of free energy is like the work that maybe we can extract. We're not guaranteed that, that, that we can. Okay. So I have another application, which I'm actually going to just like breeze over uh, for interest of time. Uh, because I might already be a bit over and maybe there's like time for one or two more questions, which I think maybe would be more interesting. But I just point out, we also analyze a situation where we have like a system with many degrees of freedom. So this could be like uh, a spin system. It could be a, a Gillard box with many particles. And um, we imagine that the different degrees of freedom essentially evolve independently of each other. Uh, that the, the, the dynamical generators can be decomposed into a sum of things that affect the different degrees, subsets of degrees of freedom separately. And we again derive a kind of uh, uh, projection operator P, which basically we can think, uh, sorry, phi, which basically destroys correlations between these subsystems. And uh, again, for interest of time, I won't go into this. Uh, we can apply it to the Schillard box with a single particle. We can show that, for example, in this case, the X and Y position of the uh, particle are like different, actually evolve separately from each other. There are different degrees of freedom that uh, can be decoupled in the potential that, that commonly would be considered. And we get these nice bounds saying that basically like any correlation between the X and Y position of uh, these degrees of freedom cannot be turned into work. So the mutual information between them has to be dissipated. Like if we start from an initial distribution where the particle is either in the top left or, or the bottom right part of the box, we cannot turn that into work. Um, and uh, right. And so maybe if you're interested, I can go back and talk about that more. But uh, I think I'll finish now. I don't know, Jacopo, if there's time for a question or not. Yes, no, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Tatum. I love the end for everybody. Um, so, yes, we have time for uh, uh, a couple of questions, and then uh, if someone wants to ask questions more informally, uh, I think uh, there is more time. So, I think, I don't know whether I understood properly, but uh, um, can you uh, turn the question um, the other way around. So uh, imagine that uh, you have a system and you want to know um, what is the best way, uh, what is the best protocol to extract work. Or you know what you are measuring on a system and, and then you want to uh, Right. Well, yeah. What is the best protocol? Um, I will say the following: that um, in some cases, so uh, for some lambda in particular, for some set of constraints, we know how to. In some special cases, we know how to achieve this tighter work bound, or uh, or entropy production bound equivalently. That's stated in terms of non-equilibrium free energy. And uh, that basically, uh, we can think of it as evolving also the system like very, very slowly. Uh, and first letting it relax to this phi p, so the initial, um, the initial projection, and then very slowly moving it to the phi p prime. And that we can show that that's going to be like an optimal protocol. That can't always be done, but in that case, uh, we can do it. Uh, I will say that, uh, so, so that's what, that's kind of, yeah. So we can sort of say some, when the bound can be achieved. Uh, there is a kind of area of research in, uh, in stochastic thermodynamics, non equilibrium statistical physics, concerned with optimal protocols and like that whole uh, quite complicated optimization problem. And that's not exactly what we're thinking about, but this does place a bound on how good an optimal protocol could be. Yeah, no, in, in this, uh, so, uh, sorry if I ask again. So in this uh, respect, there are these results on the reversibility of protocols. The fact that if your uh, 
protocol is time reversible, then you can saturate the bar. So where do you see, uh, how does this, uh, I mean, is there any relation with, uh, with your work here? Um, you can think of it like this. So we know the protocol in general, it won't, it won't be totally thermodynamically reversible because we have this bound on entropy production. So if entropy production is not zero, by definition, that means we're not thermodynamically reversible. But you could think of it like if we, uh, if we can first relax to this manifold, so relax to phi p, uh, and then thermodynamically reversibly go from phi p to phi p prime, then that's the best we can do. Mm -hmm. So this is clear, yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Yes, may I ask yes. a couple of questions? Um, thank you, that, that, was, that was really interesting. Um, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to dig a little bit more on, uh, on the Ziller box, box example uh, to understand a couple of things. So, uh, so let's consider the situation that you just described, but now your measures are that the particle is in the top quarter of the box or in the lower three quarters or something like that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you apply your top-down symmetry argument here, yes, you would not get zero on the right-hand side of the inequality. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. So it, it, this argument applies only if you select a specific kind of observation among the many ones that you can do in the Right, so that's a, that's a very good point. So yes, so this is kind of the cleanest case. I will say that even no, even in the in the observations you you made, uh, you talked about, um, so it, we will get a tighter bound than the second law gives. So basically, we will show okay the maximum uh, uh, free energy uh, the free energy you can extract this work is lower than that which would be given by by uh, the second law. Uh, but I, I will, so, but it won't be in zero. And like I said, this shows that we basically derive a tighter bound, but we do not guarantee that it can all, always be achieved. And uh, here I will say two things. One is, you know, we're looking at a very specific set kind of bound on entropy production and work, which can be basically written as, and I didn't talk about this, it can be written as this drop of a state function, right? It can be written as this drop of an effective free energy. And this is, you know, in general, this is a very restricted set of bounds. It's a very nice set of bounds because I think it's very interpretable. Uh, and uh, it gives us this effective free energy. But in general, you know, uh, they can't always be saturated, basically. Um, and the other thing I would say is, for example, with the Schiller box, uh, you know, one reason why it's, it's not maybe as tight as we might hope it to be in some cases is notice the argument is really general. It just says, all we assume is that there's vertical reflection symmetry. So this holds, even if the partition is not vertical, but it has some like crazy vertically symmetric shape. Right, so if it has like the shape of a hunting bow, for example, or, or if there's like a, a many partitions, but they're all vertically symmetric. So if there's many hunting bows or something moving around. Right, so uh, the same bound still holds. It only assumes that the potential has a vertical symmetry. Okay, and another short related question. Again, a little variation of what you were talking about. Suppose now that the the barrier, the partition, is uh, slightly slanted. Yes. Uh, yes. Can, can you apply symmetry arguments to that situation as well? Because you know that if it's just slightly slanted, you could be able to extract a lot of work and you could sort of tune continuously from one situation to another. Is there any way of putting this uh, theoretical framework to, to use in this uh, less symmetric situation? Um, so there are some other cases that we analyzed that, that, so as I said, I didn't talk about in depth of modularity, that we also have some results about coarse graining, what we call, so there are other cases which are not about symmetries, but if the partition is slightly slanted, very good question, the symmetry no longer holds, our results no longer apply. And it's very interesting 
but this will probably be for future work to see if there's some kind of, you know, epsilon version of this result. I mean, in general, um, it's not clear to me uh, there, there, that, what, there, that there is always a bound, you know, it might depend on like, like, yeah, it's not clear to me what the bound should be, but, but right, as soon as you break the symmetry, even by a little bit, our results no longer hold. But just to clarify there, the precise results where there's the fee for the uh, symmetry group don't hold. But the more general mm -hmm. framework about if you can find a manifold um, defined by operators that commute with L and obey the Pythagorean theorem, um, I don't think we know, do we, Artemy, that that cannot be done in any no. situation as opposed to that no. we just don't know how to do it? Right. The, the, so David makes a very good point. It, it might be that one could find a different operator phi, but uh, we don't know how to do it in that case. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I think we are a little bit uh, over time. Okay. So this one, yeah, I see Edgar that wants to ask a question. So uh, it's, it's a short question. Uh, so um, I just wanted to mention that uh, there was some work, uh, including mine, uh, some years ago, let's say 10 years ago, on um, doing um, similar uh, analysis on, uh, there was a feedback protocol of a system that either it, it has a broken symmetry at time zero. So it, like you say in your example, the system is, Initially, uh, the, let's say the particles are only one part of the box, which could be anything, or a system which initially is an entire box and ends in a broken symmetry state. Uh, mm -hmm, we did mm -hmm. a theory and experiment about this. Uh, our paper is called Energetics of Symmetry Break Universal Features in Energetics of Symmetry Breaking. And what we found is that it's, it's a bit different to what you do because we get a bound for the work that cannot be written as a difference of two effective free energies. Mm -hmm. So there is an extra term that uh, depends on what is the probability, for example, of uh, getting um, into this restricted area in the phase space in the backward protocol. Uh -huh, this is the uh -huh. term it, it is, I'm telling you this because it could be that your theory is a generalization of what we did. Okay. That's very interesting. I've come across your article. Uh, but I will admit I have not read it as carefully as I should. So no, that's no. that's very interesting. I will. Um, no, because the, there will, is a, uh -huh. there's a sequence of papers on this. Uh, the first uh -huh, one, uh -huh. two thousand eight, um, is called differential fluctuation theorem. But I think it's uh, it could be related to your work. I just wanted to. I see. To give you. I will. Uh, I will. Uh, the, thank you for the pointer. Yes, that's really interesting. I will also say maybe as an interesting literature. Pointer, I, I presented a kind of earlier version of this, and it turns out that there's, uh, especially our work on symmetry is related to some things that um, have been done in quantum physics with so-called uh, quantum resource theories. Uh, so we, in quantum physics, it's quite popular to take a kind of similar operational approach to defining free energy, which is uh, you define it via how much work you can extract during different operations. And people, it turns out people have looked at something similar to what we did uh, for quantum systems, and they they call this they, this this um, symmetrizing operator is called the twirling operator. Actually, I guess in quantum physics. Um, and uh, if any of you are interested, there's a, there's there's a lot of literature on it, but there's also uh, this paper by Vaccaro in 2008 on on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. But thank you, Edgar. Uh, I will, I will definitely I look up your papers. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, I'll 